Hi everyone, we're going to start at five past, oh it's now five past, but in the meantime please share in the text chat um, what you do and where you're joining us from today. Oh great, we've got Alice from East London, she is our uh, one of our regional coordinators for Emerge Africa, we've got Tanya from Stellenbosch University um, doing uh, engineering in adaptive game design, oh fascinating Tanya, we've got Jerome is from Nigeria, my colleague Sam Lee Pan, who's also here at UCT, and Kath as well. Okay, great, folks are continuing to share uh, where they're from. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to introduce our presenter for today. So today we've got Karen Brignare, who is going to help us think through this question of why is adaptive learning important as an e-learning tool? Um, Karen is an Executive Director for the Personalized Learning Consortium at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, uh, where she manages a network of universities committed to student success through personalized learning. Um, I'm not going to read her full bio, I'll rather share the link in the text chat, um, you probably even read it already, and I'm going to hand over to Karen. Thanks so much, Nicola and Jacob. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Um, I find this a fascinating um, topic um, and a uh, interesting e-learning opportunity for all of us. Um, adaptive learning um, seems to, and most of the research points to um, a very promising uh, future uh, for these kinds of tools uh, to help us uh, improve student success. Um, here in uh, the U.S., this is actually, the tools are actually being used in, in various ways um, throughout the education system. I'm going to be speaking mainly to um, the higher education uh, work that I'm doing. I may um, have a few references um, to some of the work that I know about um, in K-12. Um, I know a little bit about what is going on um, outside of the U.S., but there may be those of you that are joining us today that actually know more um, about uh, whether or not this is a growing sector um, in certain areas of Africa, um, or whether or not people are just sort of um, waiting to see whether or not it is a good tool to use. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I think we already had a question on the difference between personalized learning um, and uh, adaptive learning. Um, at this point, um, I'd say um, at least here um, uh, in the U.S. and I think to some extent uh, in Western Europe, and um, Australia, Canada, we're probably in somewhat of alignment under the notion of the differences. Adaptive learning would actually um, fall under personalized learning, but personalized learning it really does seek to accelerate um, the student learning process by tailoring both the instructional environment as well as tailoring um, the administrative um, environment. Since we're talking about learning, I'm not really going to be talking about some of the other things happening with personalized personalized learning, um, but just to give you an example, so here again um, in the U.S. where let's say we have a lot of community colleges um, and we have a lot of open access institution, which means anyone who finished their high school diploma um, can enter in um, to these universities. Um, you can imagine the variety of student knowledge um, and that uh, leads to um, differences in understanding on how to follow a degree path um, and what 
actually to do. So there's a lot of tools around helping um, our students, whether they're adults or whether they are 18-year-olds, um, actually do better um, in um, it, through advising. Um, so those are some of the kinds of personalized learning tools. Um, we do think personalized learning is about um, technology, but it doesn't always have to be about technology. It can be what good faculty, good teachers already do. Um, that is being able to notice where a student may be having problems or um, quite frankly being able to notice where a student is excelling um, and giving them additional work um, to move forward. Um, so yeah, Jerome, I, I think um, I think I would agree with that. I think um, adaptive learning has some uh, has all of the same goals as personalized learning, but it's a much smaller set of tools than personalized learning. Um, so it's part of the the sort of subset is what we're agreeing to here um, in the U.S. So let me get into then what is adaptive learning. Um, normally, um, I wouldn't read this to you, but given that I can't really see your faces, I'm going to read part of this, um, as an approach to creating a personalized learning experience. So here you see they're referring to the personalized learning. Uh, um, for students, adaptive learning takes a sophisticated, data-driven, and in some cases, non-linear approach to instruction and remediation. Uh, adjusting to the learner's interaction and demonstrated performance level, and subsequently anticipating what types of content and resources learners need at a specific point in time to make progress. Um, so what we can now begin to understand with adaptive learning, we are really um, looking at the software. Um, and the software can be built with, a, again, a variety of tools. Um, they're often called um, sort of rich media feedback tools that are adaptive in the way that they're based on what um, in computer, um, you know, computer science we're, we're calling, uh, they're calling more uh, rules-based um, or decisions-based. Um, and that is actually, I think one of the uh, participants today uh, already talked about digital games. Um, did many early digital games were based on you do this, then uh, the system will do this. Uh, adaptive, fully adaptive systems begin to get into um, AI, artificial intelligence. Um, but they often need a huge amount of data, and both that's from the student input side, along with the content and assessment side. So now we're starting to deal with the fact that we have algorithms um, that are using and gathering information um, about you and then presenting you with new information. Um, for faculty and for teachers, what this means is that many of us begin to have a dashboard um, and that kind of dashboard shows us the class at large but it also shows us um, and and I'll keep moving on I've got a couple of pictures none of I don't think any of the dashboard um, but it, it shows us um, that um, where our students might be struggling and might not be struggling. And what is happening here in the best case scenarios um, is um, oftentimes that courseware, the adaptive courseware, or the adaptive product is being um, used and integrated pedagogically um, into the classroom environment. And what that means is students know they need to do and use these tools. They're not just do this homework kind of stuff, right? It is that I am using the information from this tool then to do something different in the classroom. So faculty are often engaging in at more active learning. Now that 
the adaptive system does most of the um, what we probably would most familiarly call the lecture. Um, we can now get the lecture out of the way by using these very sophisticated tools and instead use classroom time in a very different way. And ideally, it's used in an active way. Um, so let me respond right now. We have a couple of questions um, out there. Um, Yes, um, I think we've already answered um, the personalized learning to the adaptive learning. Um, and yes, actually, we do have um, large lecture sections um, from anywhere to 100 to 600 students in large lecture sections also using these tools. Um, and it, it's working quite well. In fact, one of the reasons that um, the U.S. post-secondary um, field is very interested is because our general education courses, that are the courses that normally students take early um, in their um, post-secondary career, are the ones that trouble them the most. And those are also the same courses that, generally speaking, are very large lecture sections. Um, so so these adaptive technologies are being used in lots of large lecture sections. Um, and then in that lecture, um, faculty are still turning around and using their time differently. Um, they're doing um, partner work, group work. They're doing, even in lectures where you can't move the desk, right? You can talk to somebody next to you. Um, so there are ways of using those large lecture halls um, differently. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on. And I see, Jerome, you have another question. But I'm going to move on first before I address those. So basically, you're getting the sense that, you know, for a long time our lectures have basically said one size fits all. Well, anyone who's ever been in the classroom um, and knows we want more students to succeed, right? Like this is a huge investment from the university side, from uh, the faculty side, from the student side, um, and quite honestly from um, our society side, wherever our, our, our government support or wherever our support comes from. And we are trying to figure out ways to make sure um, we're more effective um, at the business of teaching. Um, so I think that's really why most of us are really truly engaged in this. And and so far, the research is it, it's not a hundred percent showing that you know we're going to see major effect size changes. But generally, we're seeing positive effect size changes. Um, and roughly, I think uh, our colleagues um, who were at SRI and have now moved on to Digital Promise have some of the best meta-analysis about uh, effect sizes overall for adaptive learning. And they're in the 0.4 range. Um, so we've got some promising um, data coming our way. All right, um, Jerome, why don't I take another one of your questions? So um, the, the tools really assist um, instructors in several ways, right? So what we're talking about um, is that in general cases, even where you're given plenty of TAs or graduate assistants, um, um, you are often, as the instructor, um, preparing the lecture, preparing the assessments, um, either grading or making sure the graders um, who help you are um, using the same uh, process throughout um, the grading. And those are um, quite important tasks, but they're also quite tedious task, right? So if all the content um, and all the assessments, not necessarily a writing assessment, right, or not necessarily um, a case study type of assessment, um, more like multiple choice um, uh, types of assessments. But I do want to make it clear the power of these tools are you can have multivariate um, input um, and have multivariate output. And what I mean by that is we're not simply talking about multiple choice 
drop and drag. You could easily think of a paragraph that is typically fill in the blank. Well, those blanks can be changed, um, and then the answers can be changed. So the kinds of assessments you can get with these tools can be quite rich. Um, and um, that grading process, that content knowledge process, that understanding where your students process, um, I think it can help uh, instructors avoid burnout so that they have more creative activity um, in the classroom. Um, so this slide basically talks about, um, you know, what do we have to put together in order to have really well-designed, adaptive um, learning experience? And while we um, have some experience as faculty um, and teachers, not all of us are as well-trained um, as we would um, probably hope. That's often an um, a criticism here in, in the U.S. about our post-secondary. That is, our, um, our K-12 um, system has um, more um, requirements on how to teach well than does our post-secondary system. And because of that, not every um, professor actually understands good design, right? Um, that learning outcomes must be supported by instructional content, um, which must be tested by activities and assessments. And all those have to be aligned. Um, and in these tools, while some people will disagree with what content and assessments are in the tools, they are better aligned than we would say probably the average um, classroom. Um, I've actually added in here a couple of links for you all to um, go to at your leisure. I'm not going to start them up inside the Adobe um, window, um, but I want to tell you a little bit about them. Um, so um, the first one is the McGraw-Hill. Um, he's actually a colleague. Um, Steve Laster um, is their chief technology officer. And he really talks about um, the learning science that they're putting into um, their products. Um, and most of, um, we have eight universities working together on this. Most of our group is very, very satisfied with um, the McGraw-Hill products. Um, and I think they're a company that um, people should look to um, and see their progress they've made around these adaptive learning um, tools. Um, the second uh, video is from uh, Nish Schoenwalker. Nish um, has been at MIT for years. He's always been um, covering work on um, uh, anything that is emerging. And he's got um, some uh, video chats that he does um, just for um, anyone to sort of explain where he is rather than, I mean, I think Nish still uh, blogs. I think there's other things that he does. Um, but Nish really talks about the principles of personalized and adaptive. And he actually is one of the few people that sort of put them in the same phrase. Um, most people have now aligned with adaptive as part of the personalized learning set of tools. OK, so let me go to the next slide. But I want to go back to Jerome's question before I miss it. Um, so um, the question is, at what point in the learner's path would the instructor aided by the tools um, to determine a particular learner is not just different, but simply unable to make progress? <coughs> Great question, Jerome. So uh, that's actually a question I'm working really hard on at trying to get um, people interested in discussing. So again, here in the US, um, we are very interested um, because, again, um, our system was built not only to, to support our best students, it was also built um, particularly back in the 1960s um, after um, several wars that we participated in, we extended um, our system to um, GIs. Um, and so when our veterans came back, they were adults. They had experiences that our 18-year-olds did not. And um, from that point, we've 
um, expanded quite rapidly um, around uh, the country in our community college and adult learning settings. A lot of those people come back with rusty skills, quite honestly, um, and um, their experiences in even um, high school or their experiences in college were not all that good. Um, and one of the questions we're asking um, is how do we remediate for them when we know that they are probably talented adults, right? So the question becomes for us is um, how much remediation can the system do um, and can we get students to do it? I don't know that we know enough, Jerome, to really answer your question like when do we give up? The issue is usually when does the student give up, right? Like what we're finding is um, our students who are not um, doing well are simply not doing enough, right? Um, so what we're trying to determine is how um, we engage students, even though these tools are usually quite engaging. When we do student focus groups, um, they're quite engaging um, and students really um, appreciate well-designed um, tools and they uh, really appreciate when the faculty notice what they've done in the tools. So I, I think the answer is um, we're still working on that problem and I, we're trying to figure out when do we know um, to give up, but I don't think we have the answer um, to that. Um, and um, I just want to go back to sort of what the presentation, because this is sort of what you what we need to understand why we don't know enough, right? Like we're pulling together um, a lot of um, educational learning theories, um, computer science, um, AI types of um, tools. And I, I think we're still trying to figure out when we pull together um, these methods, um, are we getting to everybody yet? And I don't know that we know the answer, but I do know this. Um, these kinds of tools are often more well designed than typical courses we've had here in the US for a really long time. So um, I want to just go back to this basics again around the learning thing, the learning um, design of this, right? And, and normally you have a subject matter um, expert and you have the, a learning design or that person may be alone. Um, but now you add in this adaptive technology. And what does that l begin to look like? So I have a couple of different representations here just to show you um, what this might look like, right? So in your normal course delivery system, one size fits all. That's what we already decided. So this is um, some pictures from a company called Cogbooks. There are they're actually out of um, Scotland, um, and um, I. Uh, there are companies coming out of Australia. I unfortunately don't know any companies um, actually coming out of um, Africa right now, um, but there are a lot of uh, venture capitalists doing work in India, Australia, Canada, um, the US, um, and then most of the major publishers um, uh, in the world, that would be like Pearson, um, McGraw-Hill, Wiley, all of them also have tools. But this is, this is a company called Cogbooks. And what Cogbooks begins to show you is now that the course delivery system is being run through a cloud-based adaptive engine, what is getting done is each of those students are getting um, a tailored set of learning paths. Um, and that makes it pretty powerful. So let's take a look at, this is a tool that actually it has been more designed for um, our K-12 environment and the company is called Dreambox. So what they're talking about is in the classroom, you have the teacher and the student. Um, and then this is their design over here, the intelligent adaptive system. And you can see where the curriculum, the learning activities, the embedded and adaptive uh, assessment is all in this one part of the system, then they're collecting information about the database of, of, of on students. And what you get from that database of 
inputs. That is, what is the student doing? Uh, um, and how is this different from other students? You begin to get very sophisticated responses from um, the system. Um, and this helps, obviously, the student do better as well as the teacher getting um, critical information about their students. I've got another one of these pictures. This one is not quite as clear, but I wanted you um, to see it. Um, and this is sort of a visualization of one, um, mo one let's call it one lesson, right? So um, in this particular lesson, you will see that there is some work that is basically like survey work. Um, you have finished it. You're done. You don't have to do anything else. Then we have a couple of them that are connected to a few other paths. Right? So in some cases, we know material has to be connected to other material to either move you forward or to help you go backward and fill in the gaps. But having this kind of visualization of how your content and your assessment connects, I think, is really powerful um, for teachers um, and faculty. Um, and um, we're looking at. Um, we're beginning to, to look at how that visualization in and of itself could actually help faculty, even if they're not using um, those kinds of adaptive um, tools. Um, so I want to move to one more, and then I'm going to answer some questions. So here is another um, tool called Newton. Um, so, so this may actually start to answer a question. Um, and um, that question is um, um, a little bit about open adaptive systems. Um, I would say um, OpenStax um, and the US, um, which came out of Rice University um, and has uh, free and open um, textbooks. Um, phys their physics textbook, I was just recently told, um, is actually the world's best-selling textbook. Um, and that um, they have designed a handful of open adaptive, um, they call it open tutor um, systems. I would say um, as far as there is a big argument amongst a group of people that the algorithms used in these tools really need to be owned by education. Um, I would say, of course, there are others who believe that educators um, cannot um, continue to run tools as well as they do when they launch and research tools, right? So there's two sides of the debate. Like if we don't know exactly what models the tools are using, um, I think there's some real resistance to continuing um, to buy off-the-shelf products. On the other hand, there's the other, um, quite frankly, model. And here in the US, this is very, very true. Very few products launched out of universities um, can be maintained in a long period of time, right? Like initially you get research dollars, you get um, maybe some capital investment um, from corporations who might be interested, but maintaining uh, a product from a university um, is often very problematic. And I'll use the example of the Open Learning Initiative. Um, again, um, uh, they had open content but not an open system. Um, and it's very difficult for them to continue to main, maintain and invest as an arm of uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, so I think we have to begin to think about the problems of open um, adaptive systems um, and how would we actually run a business. The case study there is probably Lumen Learning, right? So Lumen Learning um, is David Wiley and Kim Thanos's company. David Wiley has long been known as sort of, um, I'll call him the godfather of open learning. Um, and um, David um, and, and Kim and um, a group of wonderful employees have launched a tool called Waymaker. Um, that tool, um, it, there is a charge for using that tool, right? Like you have open content, um, but the what the things that the Waymaker is doing um, usually cost somewhere around 
$25 a student. However, that's typically negotiable, right? Um, and I don't want to say that that's not a reasonable price because that's a lot less than most American students spend on textbooks, right? So I think the open and adaptive learning systems are far behind um, the current commercial varieties with the exception of those that I mentioned and that would be um, what we have at um, Carnegie Mellon and Stanford in the OLI systems, what we have at Lumen Learning, um, a company um, that is for profit but making open learning tools and then OpenStax. Um, so there's a lot of growth potential there, but there's a lot of questions to ask how you sustain things. So let me go back to um, addressing um, the content map one more. Newton really is a, somewhat of an open system. They own all the algorithm um, and mathematical sequencing, but folks can go in and decide how they're going to use the content. Um, and it, what you can't see on this slide, but you can certainly go to their dashboard and, and recognize it, is that each of those nodes are include how many times people have accessed this content, whether or not it was included by somebody else, and whether or not your content, if you included it, became important for somebody else's learning path. So there are very interesting ways of beginning to share this material. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide, but I'm going to also check for some questions here. Um, so I'll let you do that. Um, okay, so Jerome asked the question on um, are these tools plug and play? So again, here in the US, um, most of these tools are um, using an IMS um, standard called LTI, um, Learning Technology Interoperability. LTI just recently came out with a new standard. I'm not sure that all these tools are certified to the new standard, uh, but generally we've had almost no one have any trouble with plug and play within their LMSs. The exception to this are if they are not um, if they have not ever plugged and played into e-commerce, right? Like the universities don't buy the or rent the content from these adaptive companies. These are like textbooks. So the students have to, and that means these companies have to have an e-commerce system. So the failures, at the early failures with plug and play have really been around their e-commerce systems more than it's been around anything else. Um, so let's talk a little bit about faculty interest. And again, I'm speaking mainly for the US, but I think some of this would probably, based on some of the questions I'm seeing, also be true um, in other areas of the world. So um, faculty here are very interested in leveling the playing field. And even if you think of, um, you know, we have some great public research universities, their mission is still access and state service, right? Even if they're not getting very much quote unquote money and funding from their state. So a as a state access institution, they serve all of their best students. Texas is an example. If you're in the top 10% of your high school, you are guaranteed a place at um, a research university. Florida does similar work. California does not because they have a they have actually a huge huge problem with too many enrollments right now, but they're trying to work in, in towards that path. And as you could imagine, uh, you know, we have rural schools and we have urban schools and we have wealthy um, school districts. Those produce different kinds of, of students, right? It may be that all of them have the same basic intelligence, right? But their uh, awareness and their um, familiarity with all kinds of things, whether or not they were able to get college courses in their high school, whether or not they were able to have a, a very good biology teacher, it really varies. So when these students come together, um, even if you're at a research university, the wide variety of academic skills is pretty noticeable. And that's not really 
almost the most important half of it. It really is around our students who we want to be more successful. Here in the US, um, and you may have heard this, but essentially we believe we need another 10 to 15 million highly educated people um, to continue to compete in the world um, starting around 2025. Um, and quite frankly, um, we lose more than um, half of our students um, that start in their first year. We probably use, lose about 30 5% and then years two through six for us, we lose another 15%. Um, and, and even though I'm saying half, the, the, um, the, the numbers are actually more dismal than that. So there are people who were asking why. I mean, do we all believe that none of those students were capable? We no longer believe that, right? But how that happens is important. So faculty are really interested in having data about student performance. They're interested in how they can use the classroom differently if they have these kinds of tools. Um, and they really do see some promise around, particularly in these lower level courses, I want to stop being the drill and practice, you know, course. I want to do something with my content. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, and I'm going to go look at a couple of questions here. So make sure I didn't miss anything. OK. Um, Nicola, I answered your question on open adaptive learning systems. Um, so the bandwidth question um, is um, probably a tough question. I would say the bandwidth issue um, are the the best way to do low bandwidth with these tools are probably going to be the tools that maximize text. Right. Um, so many of these tools are starting in to to get to rich multimedia. So I'll give you an example of a tool out of Australia, um, Smart Sparrow. Um, and um, those guys can design, I think there's an open um, bio um, habitable feature. They got money from NASA, um, and um, that's our, our space um, agency here in the US, um, along with um, and working with um, the university, oh, no, Arizona State University, and created a whole new type of science course. Um, that um, course is beautiful. Right? Uh, on the other hand, I don't think it would work on the bandwidth. Um, most of the adaptive courses I've seen, though, um, do still work with mostly text. So I think in that case, I think we would be able to see, um, uh, or you'd be able to test. Like Lumen Learning would be a good one to test. I don't know what they let you drive. Open Stacks would be a good one to test. Although I've seen that they've added in some pictures. So I don't. I don't know enough to know about open bandwidth. What we hear is, of course, you know, um, the expectation is that everybody has access here in, in the US. That's not completely true. Um, and um, the access issue does vary. Like when you're in certain areas, quite frankly, can be in a city as much as it can be out in rural areas, um, your connections, particularly when you're on wireless, are not always that good. We have not heard many students saying they can't do the work in the adaptive tools. Um, what is a big concern here in the US is accessibility. Um, and I would say these tools really vary. Like the platforms themselves may be accessible. And what we mean by accessibility is um, oftentimes can um, do they have alt tags where a blind person or a hearing impaired person um, could actually get the information in a separate way? Um, and that's not always the case. All right, I'm going to turn back to the slide that I have <coughs> up here. I actually um, think very, very highly of um, Dr. Kathy becker Blees. She's out at Oregon State. Um, and she is constantly challenging the adaptive systems, although she uses those in her general psychology course. She was recently, <clears throat> and I hope she thinks of it as, as a good thing, uh, recently promoted to be the department chair. 
but she really questions uh, the issue around ownership. Uh, she questions the content that goes in there, but she will also tell you it is making a difference, right? But what she's worried about, and this is the question that I think Jerome asked early on, is is it working for all students? Right now, she doesn't have the evidence that she's got um, students um, that are participating, um, that come in with weak um, previous GPAs, or let's call in here in the US, we do standardized testing for most of our research universities. So I, I, would, I would tell you to go watch this one um, at your leisure. All right, so let me tell you a little bit more about our grant, and then I'm going to um, also look for more questions. Um, uh, so the grant that we're working on, you can see all the names of the universities that we're working with. Um, we've created a community. It is a cross-institutional collaboration. Um, the folks that um, are working together are all program managers or program directors for adaptive learning at their campuses. Um, they have all been looking at general education courses. Um, they were given a list of providers. This list was not produced by us. It was produced um, by our funder. Um, separately with um, different research. Um, and that's actually made it easier because this is a scaling grant. A scaling grant means you're not just reinventing adaptive learning um, and adaptive content. You are trying to find out if we use it in the majority of our biology classes, our Math 101 classes, will it make a difference? And quite frankly, um, Arizona State, who has been working on this problem probably now for five years, said after three years, it did make a difference. So you may not see the impact immediately, um, but you will see um, an impact according to them and their research. Um, faculty are being engaged by incentives. Um, those incentives often are money. Um, sometimes they are um, reduced teaching loads and or grad assistance, or um, sometimes we use undergraduate learning assistance. This varies by institution. We at APLU did not have a specified model, right? We wanted to respect each of the institution's culture. Um, they do have common reporting requirements, and they do have to all report to us twice a year on how things are going and whether they're scaling um, well. All right, let me, you can continue to read that and let me just scan once again for um, any other questions that I might have missed. Uh, all right, so I see Jerome has another question in terms of uh, uh, AI. So I'm not an artificial intelligence. I'm not a computer scientist. I am not a mathematician, right? I am an educational technologist. Um, I typically am um, a administrator, but I work on the emerging tool sector, particularly when I believe the tools are at a stage where um, they can actually be used in the classroom. So my answer to that would be with a lot of caveats, um, at the, pointing to the, my lack of expertise. Um, but yes, the system does monitor itself. In fact, we have um, people who will tell us that let's say they've had uh, a thousand students take the course um, and that the course um, will continue um, to get better right and that it will begin to point out where there are deficiencies um, it does monitor itself and it will begin to give better responses than were even created by the subject matter experts, right? So uh, I think the AI portion of this is really early stage. Um, the machine learning is at really early stage because one, it needs a lot of training, right? We 
we have not had scale to train these kinds of tools. When we get that, I think we're going to see some powerful um, kind of stuff. Um, so I'm going to move on um, to the next one. Here's the list um, in case you wanted to know. I already mentioned a couple of these on here. I mentioned McGraw-Hill, Lumen. I told you about Cogbooks being on there. There's Newton, um, Smart Sparrow. Um, but there is a difference in the set of tools, right? And and let me talk to you. I think I have this on here, right? Um, the types of adaptive learning products, um, particularly from this list. By the way, this list is not all inclusive. And quite frankly, it does not include many tools um, beyond a few, like I said, in Western Europe um, and uh, a few from Australia. Uh, most of these are Canadian, US, Western Europe, um, and Australian-based tools. Um, so the adaptive courseware uh, um, right today, the, the library of adaptive courseware includes the most popular courses. And what I mean by that is the courses that serve the most volume of students, right? So these are your 100 courses, your 200 level courses. Um, the adaptive courseware also has limited flexibility, just like a textbook, right? Like a lot of textbooks are written and faculty ignore four chapters out of the 15, right? So it, that same kind of limited flexibility is happening um, today. Um, in addition, not all dashboards are easy to read or easy to use. Um, and they, they definitely include a place for faculty roles, right? But these adaptive courseware, where it is it's more like a textbook um, and e-learning. It is not just an e-text because an e-text often uh, is just it's just online and it's not interactive and nor is it adaptive, right? So this is a higher version and you're using more um, technology with it. Um, but those are sort of what we would call in, in a slightly negative way a course in a box right so a lot of faculty are not really happy with that but remember in our grant this was a scaling grant we wanted to, you to get started well quite frankly a lot of people have actually found tools to get started with and I would almost argue that if you're starting and you're starting from scratch unless you are an incredibly talented game designer, uh, adaptive learning designer, this is your research area, that trying the tools that come out of the box would help you and your students learn a little bit about what is going on in an adaptive tool. On the other side of the coin, we do get, um, we are beginning to see a middle ground between um, the adaptive courseware and the adaptive platform. So a platform is one where any kind of content that includes another publisher's content can be ported in so you can create content um, you can design content you can pour in content and that means your own um, digital content can be actually uploaded to these systems what i do tell people is you will be shocked at the amount of content needed to run one of these systems, right? Like, even if you've taught an online course or a distance education course, the amount of content there is still actually pretty paltry. Uh, um, you are looking at, I'm just going to give you some numbers, right? Like, you're probably looking at more like anywhere between 100 to maybe 500 learning objects inside of an online e-learning course, right? In these courses, you, you're looking at more like 1,000 to 5,000. I've had um, content um, companies tell me they had 15,000 learning objects in their courses, right? So the amount of content needed to get to a good course is quite high, and it's usually above um, the time that any one faculty has to um, be part of this. Um, the good part about the um, they are completely flexible. So you can design, like if you're creating the first ever um, course on you know, artificial intelligence and adaptive learning, you could design it all by yourself, right? And those are the kinds of tools that we would use. All right, I'm going to uh, look for questions again um, and go in here. All right. Okay.
Okay, Jerome, I think we were just talking about you'd prefer a platform um, and not necessarily the content. Um, that I would say the same um, caveat that I said is generally speaking the amount of content that has to go into a platform is quite large. Um, all right, and I see a question from John. Um, how do we deal with adaptive learning and fairness um, or level the playing field for students in terms of grading? Um, hmm, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm going to take a guess because I'm not sure I completely understand it. Um, so the tool itself has been set up to mastery level standards, which are designed by the faculty who are using um, the tool. That even if you're using an out of the um, course, uh, I mean an out of the box course, you can set the fairness level, whether that's an 80, whether that's a 90, or whether that's a hundred. Um, you can design that. Um, so those are pretty flexible sides of that. Um, so we can move on to that. All right, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our results. Results, and then I'm going to go back to the questions here in the end. All right, so after six months, we've already got 22,000 enrollments. You can see that this is a wide variety of beginning level content. Um, and we have quite a lot of agreement amongst um, our grantees um, on which courses they're working on. I would say probably within the next um, year, we'll have a lot more business courses um, that may show up here. Um, but I think the rest will stay about the same. Um, and um, in addition, part of our grant, it is not the deliverable, but it was to make sure that we were using different vendors. And you can see our teams have experience now with 12 different vendors. Um, and most of that experience is is good. Um, there are exceptions, right? So there are exceptions to that. Um, so there are tools out there that can help you decide. Um, there's a courseware and context framework. There are some ed tech management tools. Both of these, by the way, are free. Um, I'm going to just show you some quick highlights of those. I want to be cognizant of time and getting back to your questions. So courseware and context framework was created here um, in the US. It was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and um, essentially, it is if you're thinking about a tool, you might want to use this as a guideline. There is also another version of this on um, a, 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 a sort of a higher ed news outlet called EdSurge. So EdSurge also has um, an adaptive learning tool selection process um, if you want to take a look at those. Um, Courseware and Context began to work with another platform. This is all online. This is an ed tech efficacy platform. What it is, is it it, and it serves K-12 um, all the way through higher ed. So what it is, is if your institution buys a membership, right, then your institution um, will get um, very um, important feedback by other users. Um, as a faculty member, you can go in and have a free account. And you can have a free account on the adaptive um, side of this. What they're looking for is from the faculty members getting free accounts is that those faculty members will upload information about tools. And that becomes more um, a more ro robust um, database. So those are the two ways that you might look at um, picking tools. So you can see in here, again, and we have individuals and we have institutions. Again, the courseware in context itself is free. Um, so for individuals um, or for institutions, you can use it. The Learn platform, which is uh, a much more robust um, efficacy, ed tech efficacy tool, has a cost to it except for individuals. All right, um, I want to go back and look at questions. Um, I am available via email. Um, and uh, we are actively working on our website, but you're we uh, welcome to go there um, and take a look at this. Um, so here we go. Uh, all right, 
So Unity, you had a question for, is it easy for instructors to read the visual representations of student data? Overall, I'd say yes. Um, however, um, this also has to do with your administrators, right? Like, so if this is a tool that is being purchased for um, a, a university versus like a textbook replacement that you as a faculty may choose yourself, um, your university may have some decisions that it can make about what data faculty see, right? So it depends on who is the owner of the data. Um, and then um, I think uh, we have a questionnaire at the faculty level, uh, what is better, bottom up versus um, bottom from department? So um, Osman, what we uh, have decided in our grant, and I'm not really answering the question, I'm just going to give you an example, um, is that the we want this to happen at the department level. We are talking about 100 level and 101 level types of courses. And what that means is we we get more and we are more likely to scale if we can work at the department level. That doesn't mean we don't also want our institutions to work with faculty. We do. And we fully expect that we won't scale to 100% on every one of those um, courses. Um, but what we are looking for um, is really, quite honestly, a combination. We want faculty champions um, with support from their departments um, to really um, start leveraging these tools. Um, and then we have a question from Tanya. Uh, are they actively designing, developing their own? Uh, yeah, Tanya, th there are definitely a lot of computer science um, folks um, that um, are looking at new and different kinds of products out there. Um, however, I, I really do have a caution. I mean, I know you said you're working on your thesis on digital and adaptive games. Um, these tools require a lot of investment, either personal time and usually more than personal time. They usually require, um, you know, programs. Um, um, and learning scientists, etc. So universities uh, will be in this as a research area. I don't know that I can say as a product, uh, a sustainable product, that universities is the first place to look for. Um, so anyways, um, any other questions? Because I do note that we are out of time. Um, I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes, but um, as most of you probably know, my morning is just getting started, and I still have to, uh, I did this from home, and I still have to get to work. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you so much. You've given us so much to think about. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, yes, thanks so much. And I think we've got a Facebook event page. What we can do is perhaps uh, collate questions on there and try and continue the discussion. That sounds wonderful. Um, I will... Um if you could send me your Facebook uh, page um, so it make it easier for me to follow, I will start following that and add that to me. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, yeah, and from all of us uh, attending today, thank, thank you for your insights and also to our participants. Thanks, guys, for uh, lending us your time as well. Um, and judging from the, the questions, it was a very... You know, a lot of light bulb moments for a lot of us. <laughs> um, so we're going to end the session. And uh, Jakob, can you share the link to the Facebook event page? Um, we'll email it to Karen as well. Um, but you can share it in the in the chat text chat so folks can continue the discussion. Um, yeah, so that's we're going to wrap up. And hope you have a good day at work, Karen. Uh, thanks so much for doing this webinar for us. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you all and have a good evening.